One of the ways to increase your visibility as a speaker or to grow in your personal brand is to make the most of media opportunities. Whether it's a podcast interview, a television show, or an Instagram Live, you become more proficient in all forms of media by learning the ABCs of media mania. L.E.K. is a veteran of over 2,800 media interviews and the best-selling author of 15 books reaching 1 million people. Ali founded Heroes at Home, a nonprofit organization that has been provided, been, has provided free financial education for military members and their families with 55 events at 35 bases in four countries. This tour was sponsored in a large part by USAA. Ali is a distinguished Toastmaster, accredited speaker, and a military wife and mom of seven. Joining us from L Los Angeles, please mo help me welcome Ellie Kay presenting Media Mania. Thank you so much, David. And thank you to the clubs uh, you from USAA. Thank you for hosting me today. And I'm looking forward to sharing a, a little bit more about how you can grow your own personal brand or you can just function in the world of media in a lot of different forms of media. A little bit of background on my family. When I met my husband over 30 years ago, he said that we could join the Air Force full time and see the world. What he really showed me was five babies in the first seven years of marriage. And that's in addition to the two children he already had for a total of seven children. And then we took the show on the road because we moved 11 times in 13 years with the military. I learned very quickly uh, that I was going to have to learn to look at life in a funny way or I was going to end up not having a lot of fun. One of the things that I did when my kids were little was I would take one of them on errands with me. And you can see in that picture there that the youngest one, Joshua, he was Mr. Maniac is what we called him because he was a turbo boy going all the time. And I took him on an errand with me. He, we went to the grocery store and he was helping to put groceries up on the belt. And the cashier looked at him and said, you are such a great helper. I bet your mother gl is glad that you're along. And he said, yeah, and not only that, but I'm good at sports. I can score goals in soccer. And I thought, hey, you know, it's great to have a confident child. And then we went to the post office and something very similar happened. He was helping me with the boxes and the clerk commented about what a special guy he was to do that. And he says, yeah, and I'm smart. I can write my name, Joshua. And then I thought, well, I might have to have a little talk with him about the difference between confidence and arrogance. And we went home. And then he disappeared. And any of those of you that are parents or have been parents of a four-year-old, you know that when they disappear, that you need to go find them. I went looking for Joshua. He was upstairs. He was looking at his reflection in the bathroom mirror, just admiring himself. And I said, Joshua, what are you doing? And he says, Mama, have you ever noticed how handsome I am? So I had the talk with him. I said that there is a difference between confidence and arrogance. And it's great that you can score goals in soccer. I think you're handsome and you can write your name, but you can't be arrogant that way and just tell everybody about it. Well, he thought about it for a little while and he finally said, you know, mama, I must be arrogant because I know I'm smart. I know I'm good at sports and I know that I'm handsome. That is the son that graduated from West Point. Uh, two of the other boys graduated from the Air Force Academy and then from the Naval Academy. So we are very much a military family. We're all USAA members it, for because we're speaking to that club. But that's my background. I also started publishing books when the youngest was about two years old. That led to media and my media led to spokesperson work that led to more speaking events and it was kind of a cycle and kind of an upward kind of cycle that just led to a lot of work in the space but what does it mean to be um, to be involved in media mania i believe that someone that really wants to excel in the area of media is someone who wants to become proficient in that space so that they can have a positive impact on the world around them. I have a few examples of that that we just love. Ronald Reagan, one of the kids, things I told my kids when they were growing up is that, sure, they could go to their friend's house and 
go to this party, but I have to call the parents. So we would always say trust, but verify. And Ronald Reagan was known as a great communicator. Michelle Obama also has a gift in media because she uses her work to be able to use intellect and insight into impacting the culture in a positive way. And then of course, Mother Teresa, even the soft-spoken Mother Teresa used her own compassion and conviction in media spaces to be able to make a big difference. So how do we do that? Where do you start when it comes to the idea of trying to get media, trying to be good at media? Let's let's start at the very beginning. And I could do a whole 45 sec minutes on a powerful pitch. And we don't have time for that today because this isn't a session on your pitch. But basically, if you want to wrap up the idea of a powerful pitch in a short amount of time, is that you have to have a title that's kind of catching. So you, you title your pitch. And when you're doing that, you may be trying to get on a podcast. You may be wanting to go on local radio or television, or you might even wanting be wanting to join someone else's YouTube for an interview session. You, you may be making a pitch to be a part of a panel in virtually. There's a lot of virtual activity that is going on right now. And one of the things that the different pitches that I have had to get me on Fox News, Good Morning America, the Today Show, some other places like that, it depends on the time of the year. And the titles that have been successful have been debt-free college. I talk about putting all of our kids through college debt-free. Uh, FICO scores for millennials, kind of unpacking that. That's been a powerful pitch. Uh, five ways to honor military families. I pitched that around July the 4th and Veterans Day. So you need a really good title. Your bio, you'll probably submit that when you're submitting a pitch so they know who you are. And basically, you're going to list your credentials, but it's not a brag sheet. So don't overdo it. It just basically tells why you're qualified to speak to that space. For debt-free college, I have all of these children that actually put through college debt-free, and I've written a couple of books on it. That's all that really needed to be said to be able to secure that, that spot in media. And then you may also want to say something personal about yourself in the bio to humanize it a little bit more and make you more approachable and someone that they would want to have on their show. And then it has to be, you have to have a unique idea. Your idea in a pitch needs to be mainstream enough to fit in, but it needs to be unique enough to stand out. And that's an artful balance, but that's what you want to go for. If you come up with an idea, you have to look at the so what factor. My idea was to talk about specific ways to be able to put your child through college and what that really looked like. So that was really unique because these are ideas other than us just paying for it and earning enough money to pay for it ourselves. There's five different ideas that we could use. So that made it a little bit unique in the fact that I had actually done it. So as you're looking through all of that, it's it's important to unpack that unique idea a little bit further as you're looking to make your pitch. Uh, this is an example of a title that is way too long and would not be one that would sell. Our family has all these cult films that we watch. Zoolander is one of them. So that would not be a good title. Don't go with something that, that is that long and doesn't really fit the point. You need to keep it simple. When you're keeping it simple, look at three different ABCs of media mania. And they're basically accurate, brief, and clear. When you're looking at how to be successful in media, that is what we're looking for. When you're looking for accuracy and you're going to be on a show, whether you're interviewing on a podcast or maybe even you're just creating your own YouTube videos, or you're going to be on your own IG live, or maybe joining someone else for their I IG live or Facebook live, or any of the even conventional forms of media. Make sure that your data is accurate. There are going to be people on their cell phones right now 
checking your facts. Jesse Vega was spoke, speaking earlier, one of our members that are here today, about how he read that currently 73% of the country is under ice and snow. And somebody else said, yes, I heard that same statistic. And people might be looking it up right now. So make sure that your data is accurate. And then do your research before you go on. You need to know what the audience is like, what kind of things they may be interested in. Do your research about the show that you're pitching, but also do your research about the audience that is gonna be watching. And knowing your media outlet and part of that research might also include a, a number of things. And then your facts. Facts are good, but death by facts, death by PowerPoints, are, is never good. So make sure you have a smattering of facts, but unless you're going on to a particular media outlet that just loves nothing more than statistics and facts and things like that, it's really not going to probably garner the interest of the general public, but it might for the outlet that you're pitching. So there's different aspects to being accurate, but it is important to do that. When it comes to your media outlet, if we just want to look at that a little bit more, if you know what the show's mission is, that really helps. Going on Fox News is going to be different than going on CNBC or CNN. They're going to have different missions, perhaps, in the way that they report the news. And knowing that is something that's really important. What kind of audience do they have? We already talked about that briefly. But you could even ask the producer to send over some information about the audience before you go on. Let's say you get on. It's better to, to know exactly what you're going to be pitching. For example, first time I was on CNBC, it was a big major hit. Up until that point, I had been on local shows for about once a week for a whole year up at Fort Drum. And I got on those local shows and I had not been on a national news show. And it was more nervous because there was going to be about 5 million people watching. It's really fast paced. And I had to think about the audience. And I had written a book called Money Doesn't Grow on Trees, which was pretty popular when it came out. And I thought that audience, even though they may be C-class executives, people that are into it was Power Lunch. So that was the name of the show. And they're into stocks and bonds and hedge funds and just high finance in a lot of different ways. But a lot of them have children. And how do you teach children to be financially responsible, whether you're bringing in seven figures a year or whether you're bringing in four figures a year? Those Some of those principles are the same. So I had to think about the audience. You need to think about the audience. And then the final thing in knowing your media outlet is that content is queen, but the audience is king. Be mindful of your audience. There are guests that go on shows and they kind of make a shtick of insulting their audience. I don't do that. That's not the way that I really like to do business, but I like to be mindful of my audience and try to give them what I feel like will be the best information and to put them first when it comes to the kind of information that I'm going to share. B is for brevity. If you're going on like national news outlets, it's going to be about a three minute hit or a three and a half minute hit. If you're going on radio, maybe local radio even, it can be 10 minutes or it can even be longer than that. And if you're going on a podcast, there's long form podcasts, which are an hour, then there's short form and short form can be five to seven minutes. So then that would be a shorter hit as well. You need to make sure that you're brief when it comes to the kind of thing that you're sharing. Let me give you an example of how I kind of learned this the hard way. I had just had my first book came out and my first book came out in 1998. It was the original extreme couponing book and it actually ushered in the entire extreme couponing phase. It was the very first book to ever published on it. it. It did become a bestseller and it led to a few media opportunities. I went, I had a pitch to get on local media in Northern New York. And my pitch was that I was giving a free coupon seminar. And if you came, you brought a canned good item and then we would give that to the local food pantry. And I was announcing that. 
I brought with me about $125 worth of groceries. I brought a receipt where I had paid $5 for those 125 groceries. All of those were really made for really great television. And they guided me through just discussing how I saved that much money, what the seminar was gonna be like. And it really caught their attention. At the end, when we went to commercial break, the talent, the host, the anchor, who was also one of the producers, kind of a you know, small local television is like that, said, you know, Ellie, this is really amazing. I can't believe you saved that much. And I had already thought ahead of time. And I said, you know, we ought to do this more often. And she said, great. Do you want to come weekly, monthly? What do you want to do? And so I got my first gig. I came back the next week. I did not know what a soundbite was. And we had three and a half minutes. I took three minutes to tell a story leading into the tip on how to save money on water. That's what I was talking about that week. And she had to cut me off, had to quickly get to the tip. I was mortified. I was so embarrassed. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is so terrible. And yet I kind of talked to myself and I thought, look, you have this opportunity, you can learn it. So I went back home and I practiced my stories to get them into a sound bite. And brevity really is that, that sound bite. When you go on short form, interviews, you're going to need to get your thoughts into 15 to 20 seconds. If you only have three and a half minutes for a particular interview and you take a full minute, you're going to sound like a talking head and it's actually not going to make for good television because there has to be that back and forth between you and the host to make for good television. So organize your tips, what you're going to say on camera, practice that. You can get feedback from trusted sources. I would always have someone watch me go on television and I learned the hard way. It was so embarrassing, but I said, that's right. On a power lunch interview one time about a dozen times in a three and a half inter minute interview, it was just mortifying, but I learned that that's what I was saying. It was one, instead of my us and ums that we count in Toastmasters, it was other filler words that would just pop up. So you have someone that will give you feedback on your interview so you can learn to become better and better at it. Have someone watch your YouTube videos if that's the content that you're creating. Have them watch your Instagram or Facebook lives to see how you could maybe improve and make sure that they're a trusted source. So if they have your best in mind, then that's great. If there's someone that just really enjoys being critical and they criti they criticize everybody, that's not the kind of person that I take feedback from, the haters out there. I don't really like feedback from someone that's just interested in being negative. But if someone has a way to highlight where I can improve and then a means of doing that, then I'm all for that. And that, of course, is why I recommend Toastmasters.org. It's a great place. There's all kinds of ways to be able to learn more in pathways. You can even take media type of tracks where you practice a lot of these different techniques that you will use before you actually take them on the road and into our communities. And then the last area, the ABCs, is for clarity. If you're going on for a specific example, and I used debt-free college earlier, was your objective met? Did you give them good ways to be able to actually get through college for less expenses and less costs? I mean, was the objective really met? And it may be hard to do that in a short form interview, but if you organize things ahead of times and you're really clear about it, let me give you one example that I would use when I was doing that interview. And I probably did that interview about 50 times. I did a lot of different kinds of interviews. Uh, sometimes I would do satellite media tours. USAA does a lot of SMTs. And basically, for those of you that are not familiar, a, an SMT or a satellite media tour is done from a studio. These days, they're done via Zoom. And the expert will go on the air and they will answer the same script that has been given to all the morning news anchors. And they'll basically wake up America 
They'll have their first hit on the East Coast around 6 a.m. They'll talk to people in New York, and then they'll start to go across the country doing the same interview over and over and over again. And I was hired by a company talking about textbooks for college, and the pitch was the way that I got our kids through college debt free. I ended up talking about the textbooks a little bit and how to save money there. But one of my go to clarity issues to make sure that people understood that was I would tell each of our children that you're not going to go to the best college that you can get into. You're going to go to the best college that you can get into that you can graduate from with the least amount of student loan debt. And with that in mind, that's the way that they would weigh their scholarships against the cost of the college. But they knew that from a very young age, that you're going to go to the one that you can graduate from with the least amount of student loan debt. And now that they're all graduated from college and living their lives with their young families, they're so glad that they're not burdened down with student loan debt. And the next point is relevant examples. I just gave you one. I just gave you a real world example. The more relevant examples that you can come up with when you're going on media, uh, the more uh, engaging it will be for your audience and the more drawn in they'll become by what you're talking about. And then a call to action. The call to action might be for a book uh, that you've written. A call to action might be for a way to draw people into your company that you're talking about, or it might just be calling people out to their higher selves to be kinder. I mean, whatever your call, whatever your purpose of going on media is, your why in that is really important so that you can issue a call to action that is going to be something that is relevant and that people can really do. And I think that one of the things that you can do, and that's why I love Toastmasters so much, is that you can practice this. We have had people in our Toastmasters club that practiced being on a panel, and then they went on a Zoom panel that was national, and they practiced ahead of time with our club. We've also had some other people in our club talk about a podcast, and they would play a clip from a podcast. And... They would help other people in a coaching sense to give them interviews so that they could be guests on podcasts or maybe even start your own podcast. Uh, a lot of the tips that I give here today are not just about being a guest and being a good interview, but being a good host if you want to start your own media and develop that kind of content. So I believe that you can become proficient in media by learning the ABCs of being a media maniac. And I like to say that a person who uses powerful words in media to affect change in a positive way is a person that will make a positive impact. And thank you so much for having me here today. I am going to open it up now for questions that we have. And uh, comments, too, that people are, are talking about here in the chat. Um, welcome to the life of a military family. They were making that comment when we were talking about us moving. Uh, Betty, I see that you're here. Did you have a question? Would you like to go ahead and answer? Ask it, please. Yes, I would. Thank you so much. If you're trying to move into the transition between volunteerism and being paid as a media person, how do you know what the rates are and how do you make that transition into being paid instead of being a volunteer? All right, that I appreciate you asking that question because it opens up the door to share some different aspects of volunteering to be on a news program versus getting paid to do it. The satellite media tours that I talked about, and someone in the chat was talking about Don Fawcett is doing that since leaving USAA. And I don't know if he's doing SMTs or what specifically that they meant with that, but SMTs are where a company pays you to go on television. So in that case, you're being paid by a corporation 
to be able to talk about like Follett books. I was talking about textbooks. And you can see these people on the morning news all the time. And they'll mention something. There is an FTC requirement for you to disclose. So the producers know that it's sponsored. If you're publishing in social media, it'd be hashtag ad. And that's where you end up getting paid is by when a third party. The Today Show is not going to pay you to be on the show. Power Lunch isn't. Fox News isn't. ABC News isn't. They're not. These news shows are not going to pay you to be on the show. But the fact that you're on the show brings visibility. It brings a marketability for other partner opportunities where then you would get paid to be on a show. Let me give you an example. I worked for American Express for a while talking about ways that you could help your children with their FICO scores with an additional card. I did that with all of our children. They all graduated with FICO scores of 750 or higher at the age of 21 or 22 when they graduated. And I went on air talking about that with American Express. I was on Fox News. It was cut from a three and a half minute hit to two minutes. And I had to get that messaging in really quickly without trying to make it seem too uncomfortable. And I got paid $3,500 for that hit. So that you know, can be, you know, that would be so nice if I made $3,500 for every two minutes. But that, those are some ways that those can be accessed. And so, Betty, thank you for asking that, answering that question. I mean, if you're interested, I can, if you, I'm going to put my address, it's Ellie at L E K E L L I E at L E K dot com. I can send you a sample rate sheet. Because the other thing that I do right now is I have now transitioned from being an author, a speaker, and media into actually being a brand ambassador agent. So I'm an influencer agent, and I represent these young brands that go on social media, they may go on television, radio, podcasts, and I work the contract because I have a lot of experience in that background, and I know how to protect them. And so I can send you a sample rate sheet so that you can see some of the rates that you or what good rates would be based on your following in your community. Thank All you right. so much. You're welcome, Betty. And then looking what we have in the chat over here, um, Betty also said that facts tell, but stories sell. It is important when it comes to media mania to be able to tell stories, but once again, they have to be concise and they have to be consistent with the messaging. Some random story may not work in that short amount of time that you have. All right, David, do we have any other questions? I know we're, we're going to be getting close to the end of our time, but I'm happy to answer any other questions that may pop up in the chat. If I have you're a interested. question. I have a question sure. for you. Why we're waiting for other questions? Okay. Uh, so you talked about being clear and and cl clarifying your message. How do you do that? How do you know that you're clear? Because sometimes you know words can mean different things, and you say something to somebody, and you think that you said one thing, but they hear something else. How do you make sure that you you are actually getting your message across? Well, that's I think David um, that that is why you have a trusted source or a trusted friend, or a mentor, or someone that you can go over this with before you go on media, so that what you really mean to say is what you're actually, in fact, saying, and that they're hearing what you mean to say. So I do think that practicing these, having like a mock interview panel, whether it's for a job or whether it's for media, I think that's a really great best practice to start to implement in your Toastmaster Club if you're not doing it already to help our Toastmaster members in real world present uh, real world situations. Uh, we did that in one of my clubs. Uh, we did a mock interview and there was a young man who wanted to be a deputy sheriff and he got an incredible interview and he had bombed his previous interview with another county. And after he practiced with us, he nailed it and it helped him go to the next level. So it's important to practice. Thank you, David. And uh, then one of our, uh, another David also said that 
we we have a different David that is saying that uh, as someone who is working on launching a podcast, what advice would you give a first time person in media and how would you grow that following? I would, if I were you, I would just do a lot of research on podcasting from people who are successful. You might even buy a course if you want to, to kind of learn the steps of a successful podcast. And you'll have to decide all kinds of things. Hosting, where you're going to host, what kind of platform you're using, long form, short form of the podcast. You will, are you going to have a co-host? Is it going to be topic driven? Is it going to be current events driven? So all of those things are things that you need to, you need to fill out ahead of time and think about ahead of time. And I've always heard from the most successful podcasters that if you just share your passion, what's on your heart, and you do it with excellence so that your content is really applicable and consistent with your core values, then your audience will find you. My daughter recently launched a podcast called Motherhood and Money Show, and their target audience is moms who delivered babies during the pandemic. So you talk about a niche of a niche of a niche, and it's it's a millennial type of show where they, they talk really graphically about their birth experiences and things like that. But it's amazing because they just launched it, and now here they are in only their second week, and they already have 3,000 downloads as soon as they posted it. So their audience found them. And I think that's a really great way to do that. All right. Do we have any other questions? Okay. Well, I think that if we're at the end of our time together, I would like to um, just thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. And please reach out to me. I'll be happy to send you uh, my notes and I can send you those rate sheets, things that you might be interested in. And thank you so much for hosting me today.